everybody. Welcome to another KeeperDAO community call. Uh, my name is Kyle, or what's the deets? I do external affairs here for KeeperDAO. And, and with us, we've got, we've got Mark, who's the head of research over at Bancor. Uh, Mark, why don't you uh, hop off a of mute and, and say hi to everybody? Well, thank you so much for having me on your community call. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we're excited to have you here. Um, so for today, what we're going to do is we're, we're just going to quickly kind of introduce Mark, maybe have him talk a little bit about his experience and his background and, and, and Bancor a little bit. And then we're just going to really dive right into community questions. You know, it'll be a little different than, than we typically structure our, our community calls. But we know that a lot of you guys have had a, a lot of interest in talking about Bancor and, and especially, um, you know, having Mark here. I think this is one heck of an opportunity for everybody. So uh, once we get started and, and, and we get to the questions part, um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have uh, pretty much just one person on the stage at a time. So, so for everybody that wants to ask a question, I'm going to ask you to click on the little hand raise button and, and leave it clicked. So I'm going to you know, take the, the first person at the top of the queue. We're going to let them you know, ask their question. And, uh, you know, if Mark has any clarifying comments or anything, um, you know, we'll go through that and then we'll move you back to the audience. But if you have a question, just kind of leave your, your hand raise button clicked. That way I have a queue formed for, for getting to the next questions. We'll stay structured and organized um, as well. Um, but really today, we're going to try and get to as many questions as possible. So, so kind of stick with us, you know, be, be patient. If you weren't the first one to get your hand up, um, and really enjoy. Uh, I, I'm excited for this conversation, and and I really am, um, am excited to hear the questions that you guys have asked and, and, and the answers that Mark's going to have for you guys. So, Mark, why don't we just kick this off with just a quick little kind of 60-second intro on yourself and your background and, and what you're doing for Bancor. Oh, certainly. Okay. Um, so, a little bit about myself. I, I actually don't come from, um, you know, the financial or economic sector. Uh, I was a, a, an academic in the physical and biological sciences for about 14 years. Uh, my uh, previous job prior to working for Bancor was uh, working at the CSIRO, which is kind of like the national labs of Australia. It's a um, you know Australian scientific research agency. Uh, it's the it's the organization that invented Wi-Fi, uh, stay in contact lenses, insect repellent. Right, it's a it's a pretty big organization. Um, and so while I was there, I was building um, what we now call the uh, rapid antigen tests for, for COVID. I was uh, among the, the first researchers to develop those kind of strip tests. And I was a, a consultant for some of the manufacturers that are now distributing them around the world. Um, but, you know, as COVID was breaking out and um, I was forced to, to stay home uh, so, so much. Uh, so I was, I was living in Melbourne in Australia um, during that whole period. Uh, we had the, the longest uh, lockdown on, on record, right? So it was a, about a two-year lockdown. Um, and so I had a lot of time to myself and I uh, was, um, you know, studying cryptocurrency and DeFi in particular. And I became pretty heavily involved with a, a bunch of different DAOs as they were developing sort of around DeFi summer. And uh, it was really the, the philosophy of, of Bancor that really uh, drew me in more than any other project. Um, and I started collaborating with the, um, the founders on a couple of different uh, financial uh, products that I had in mind. Uh, one of them came to fruition, which is now called the Bank of Vortex, which is, uh, helps to offset the inflationary pressure on BNT as a result of our um, impermanent loss insurance and, and uh, has brought the protocol to sustainable levels, which is really nice. Um, so what, what is Bancor? Bancor is a decentralized liquidity protocol. It was actually the first decentralized liquidity protocol. Uh, it was invented uh, partially inspired by um, our uh, work in community currencies, which was uh, which predates our, our work as a um, as a DEX. Um, it is kind of inspired by uh, some of the um, some of the ideas that was put forth by um, Bernard Lita who was the, um, the chief economist for, for Bancor um, prior to his passing. Um, and he's actually best known for um, inventing the euro, right? So, so Bancor has, a, 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 let's say, a, an excellent um, you know, pedigree when it, comes to, um, when it comes to sort of uh, commerce and, um, and financial models and um, you know, really pushing the boundaries on, on what can be done uh, with with financial systems, um, and so yeah, I guess partially due to that um, credibility, uh, I was extremely attracted to the idea 
Um, and after yeah, after collaborating with the founders for for a few months, they they offered me a, a full time position, um, continuing to um, develop new new ideas for them. Uh, shortly after joining the team, um, I was tasked with um, solving, let's say, some of the the major pain points affecting uh, Bankwell's version two point one. Um, analyzing the um, the financial performance of the protocol and and a few other things. And that body of work eventually culminated in uh, us realizing that we needed a, a new platform. Um, and so I was then tasked with designing our version three. And I'm excited to say that we're now just a, a few short weeks um, from from seeing that come to a, a full release. So it's a it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, I can only imagine, and you know, I, I I've been looking forward to it. Oh, I even see uh, Glenn here as well. I mean, you guys have have done a really good job about. Uh, informing folks and and looking towards uh, you know that launch and and getting people excited. So I, I I'm really pumped for you guys to see what happens next. Thank you very much. So why don't we go on ahead and and open it up? Let, let's start this AMA right. Um, so if you've got a question for Mark, go on ahead and and raise your hand. We'll get you up on stage. So while we're waiting for uh, community members to to volunteer. Uh, maybe it would be a good idea if I, I chat a little bit about our existing collaboration with with KeeperDAO. Um, yep. So yeah, so Bankor was actually the um, I, I I don't know if we were the first at this, but uh, one of the the key ways that we've already integrated with KeeperDAO is through our gasless um, limit order functionality. Um, and so our uh, our front end team and some of our contract developers were um, close collaborators with um, the devs at KeeperDAO for for some time. Um, and we still have um, via our front end uh, the ability to execute gasless trades um, using our, um, you know, using our, our liquidity pools and also the the liquidity that all of the Keeper network has has access to. So we're already integrated in a, a in a, a pretty um, in a pretty productive way. Um, but I'm looking forward to um, to teaching everyone about uh, more ways that I think that we can work together. Awesome. All right, I'm, let's hear, I, I don't have anyone in the queue yet. Um, let me see what's going on. Well, I know that I at least had a first question for you. Oh, hey, we got two coming sure. in. Um, uh, we'll let the community go, I'll save, I'll save it. Um, let, let's let L, L come on up and speak. L1000, why don't you hop on up? Hello, L. Hey, Mark, good to, uh, good doing, to talk to you uh, through another medium as well. <laughs> okay so um i guess my question is is a little bit um longer um and and discusses about like the larger plan and context that we've been working at for a while now uh, a lot of it in the background right uh, discussing since december already about what the future could look like in terms of the uh, <clears throat> the coordination game staking contract and uh, how it might conflict with uh, you know people pulling liquidity from the bank or pools to earn the uh, uh, the uh, the yield from the the coordination uh, game instead yeah. coordination game revenue uh, because the bribes uh, that we're currently using will be directed there and then the the uh, coordination game uh, uh, revenue as well so. We've had uh, certain concerns from the community regarding the uh, security aspects of it, right? Uh, and yeah. I guess, like, I would like you to speak a little to that in terms of like what the the future could look like when we want to build both the uh, or we want to give people both the opportunity to earn um, the the revenue from the coordination game, but also. Um, so it doesn't come at the cost of of uh, deep liquidity of on chain uh, or deep deep on chain liquidity of Ripple. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so there's there's quite a lot there to, to discuss. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I reorganize the the question a little bit so that we can um, sort of um, you know it, it talk about it. I'd say in sort of as we work down the pyramid in, in, with regards to high level concepts and then further down into the weeds. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about the this idea that. You know, stakeable assets um, have sort of a competing demand for for on-chain liquidity. This is uh, this is not a, a new issue. Um, if you were around during um, the the beginning of of 2020, maybe the the back end of 2019, 
you would have seen a lot of these projects start to be released where there is some sort of um, staking incentive, right? Or, or, or some utility, some financial reward um, that is garnered on an asset um, through virtue of staking it within the protocol that it was developed for. So I can think of a couple of uh, really convenient um, examples. One would be something like SNX. So the SNX token is the default collateral for um, mincing synthetic assets on, on the synthetics protocol. And its collateralization ratio, I think, is 7.5x, which is quite high. So that means for every dollar of um, gold bars or every dollar of Amazon stock or, or whatever um, a user may want to mint on synthetics, they need to provide $7.5 worth of SNX tokens. And this was seen as being an extremely bullish scenario. As demand for the SNX token increases, um, that's going to mean that the collateralization ratio is also increasing. Um, and as liquidity dries up, because so much of it is staked within the protocol, um, that it would allow you know, very small amounts of, of buying pressure through demand for the token to cause its price to appreciate. Um, we now know that this is an extremely bad assumption. Um, and I think what it neglected, um, or you know, that, that particular bull thesis, what it neglected to realize was that it's symmetric. If there is a very poor liquidity for an asset, um, it's also true that a small amount of selling pressure can also cause its price to crash. It's also true that when liquidity looks bad, um, that uh, a lot of the high volume traders um, and people that want to secure a, a relatively large proportion of the um, of the token supply, they're not looking to become, you know, whales necessarily in your project, but they do want to know that they can comfortably exit from um, and gain entry to uh, a, a, an investment choice. And so when liquidity looks really bad, um, they tend not to do that. And that can mean that the, the market loses interest in an asset. Um, this is precisely what happened to SNX. Uh, it, the demand for the token, the popularity of the token was so high that at one stage, 95% of the market cap was staked within its own contracts. Um, and that diminishingly small 5% that was left, um, only a fraction of that was liquid. And so price discovery for SNX has basically been broken um, for almost a year. Um, I actually, I spoke to, uh, to Kane Warwick about um, some of these ideas. Um, and, you know, obviously he, he didn't, he, this was not used to him. The, the synthetics developers and the founders were well aware that um, they created inadvertently a, a liquidity problem for their asset and that that was uh, punishing them over, um, over the, the bull cycle. And so the, the reason why we were talking was because what Bancor version three is really seeking to introduce is a, a permanent solution to these kinds of issues through the uh, development of uh, fungible and composable pool tokens. Um, so unlike other DEXs, uh, Bancor version 3 will be offering pool tokens that are 100% single-sided. So you know, we, we have single-sided staking today, but it's kind of an aesthetic um, skin over the top of what is still uh, a version 1 contract. So the, the two-sided pool token system is still in effect. It's just sort of out of, um, out of sight. But in the background, all of our impermanent loss contracts and everything else um, are still using the the, the, the two-sided pool token to, to achieve the single-sided staking and impermanent loss insurance effects. Um, but Bankwell version 3 is a complete reboot. We've, um, there isn't a line of code in, in version 3 that currently exists in either the version 1 or version 2 contract. It's, it's brand new, everything from scratch. Um, and the, uh, the composability and fungibility of our pool token system and their, their single-sidedness as a first-class citizen was of, of paramount importance when we were designing that system. The reason for it is that uh, we realized that um, token projects are always going to want to have utility um, for the tokens that they, for the, that they have. But they also don't want to concede um, liquid markets um, or compete with the liquidity of their token with regards to that staking demand. And so the, the answer is to have a system that allows users to do both, right? Something where um, you can have tokens that are completely liquid, but then also stakeable um, inside a, a project's own contracts in return for whatever that, that token is supposed to do. So in the case of SNX, uh, we were talking about the uh, a use case 
where uh, SNX stakers would be encouraged um, to provide liquidity on Bancor and then use the Bancor pool token to mint synthetics um, on the, the SNX contract. Um, and it's absolutely possible to do this. Um, what's interesting is that we're still headed in that direction, right? I'd say that this is a, um, a problem that's facing the entire cryptocurrency market that a lot of project teams, at least, they either underestimate the significance of this issue um, or they are ignoring it. Um, this is one of the reasons why since um, the Chainlink SmartCon conference, I've been trying to introduce this idea of superfluid liquidity. Um, and it was appropriate to do that at the Chainlink conference because I think the Link token might soon be experiencing these kinds of effects. The uh, Chainlink community is so excited for, um, for explicit staking opportunities. And it's possible that the demand to, to stake tokens on Chainlink's network will completely overwhelm it. Um, and that would mean that Chainlink liquidity elsewhere on, on chain or even on secondary markets like, um, like Coinbase or uh, what have you. Uh, could actually start to dry up and uh, affect the um, the price discovery of the Chainlink token. So, you know, you don't have to look far to to find other examples of this. Um, just recently, I was talking with Liquidity, um, who also has like a revenue sharing type system um, for staking LQTY. Um, and you know, as their unlocks are, are starting to come up with uh, some of their seed investors, they're kind of looking around the the ecosystem and realizing that. Um, all of this staking demand for their token has really hurt their ability to um, to maintain healthy uh, healthy markets as the the token supply starts to increase. So it's not a an isolated event. It's it's something that is um, pervasive, um, and I'd say poorly understood. And so what Bancor is really trying to introduce is that okay, stake your tokens in something like a Bancor pool. And we'll, you know, and you will receive a, a completely uh, composable pool token that can be used for that same aspect. And that means that you no longer have to compete with uh, liquid markets for the um, for the desired use case of, of the token that you have. And so, in the case of of Rook, um, I think that this is the the reason why we're we're on this call. Um, if there is going to be a, a revenue sharing um, component to the to the Rook token, and that's one of the reasons why that, that token is valuable, right? If that's part of the narrative for why people should buy it, then it's possible that if the use case becomes compelling enough, that um, that the uh, the ability to to discover the price of Rook or to maintain healthy entry and healthy exit from from that asset is going to be encumbered. So why not use, um, you know, either uh, a, a liquid derivative such as BN Rook, which is um, the, the prefix that we assign to the pool tokens on version three, to achieve the same thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to replace it, by the way. It could just be accepted alongside it. Um, our pool tokens are, are generic ERC-20 uh, contracts, and they have all of the same properties that you're, you're already used to, except they're slightly better than the standard pool token for, for several reasons. One is that uh, because it has no knowledge of the other side of the pool, right? It's denominated entirely in, in Rook in, or entirely in the asset that was staked. Um, then it actually maintains um, exposure to the Rook price, right? These, these pool tokens will appreciate and depreciate as the Rook token does. Um, you, it, it's not the case that, for example, the, um, that, uh, so let's consider an alternative, right? Let's imagine that it was a pool token from Uniswap version two, where it was staked against ETH or staked against USDC or something like that. Um, as the uh, as these two assets uh, diverge in price, or as one, you know, let's say ETH crashes versus Rook or Rook moons versus USDC, whatever, um, this would mean that the uh, the pool token that you're staking is um, is now volatile with respect to the Rook token, which is probably not acceptable because it's going to open up all kinds of weird arbitrage opportunities and things for, for the same um, opportunity that, that naked rook stakers are, are, are getting. Um, and so, the, you know, that, that adds a, another layer of complexity and potential exploits on top of, on top of the system that would really best be avoided. So Bancor's pool tokens are special because, um, because they are denominated entirely in rook. Uh, you don't have that kind of attack surface area, but more than that, um, it's more ideal collateral because as um, as trading takes place across the bank or pools, um, it will actually garner Rook uh, a 
onto the pool token at a uh, at a slow rate, right? At, at whatever the rate is um, of the the revenue accrual on the pool. So if you're collateralizing something or um, you know or, or trying to increase your um, your your share in some revenue uh, sharing process, then having a, a pool token that is slowly accruing more rook underneath it. Uh, might actually be a better way to um, to have a, a a slight advantage, but not a a huge advantage over your peers who are staking naked rook. Um, with regards to security concerns, this is obviously um, you know this is obviously a, a a topic that should be explored very carefully. One uh, one way that you could um, that let's say that one pointed criticism about using pool tokens for any application is that historically they have been a problem. Um, you, for example, I, I don't know if anyone here was was affected by the exploit on Cream, um, but that was a pool token specific uh, exploit, and the reason why that exploit was um, was possible in the first place was because the pool token itself garners value from um, from a vault balance. So if someone can um, ever get to a position where they have secured a very large amount of the pool token supply for themselves, then they can essentially add uh, an arbitrary amount of tokens into the vault and thus cause the, the price of the pool token to appreciate very quickly. Um, and this means that if you are um, involved in a protocol that's using that vault as a price oracle or something else, um, that you can uh, essentially, um, you know, exploit that uh, to um, to steal money, which is what happened in in Cream's case. But it could happen. There's so many. There's an infinite number of ways that this exploit could have been performed. Uh, it was just so happened that it's a uh, it's a very convenient way to do it against a lending protocol. So we were actually aware of these kinds of issues long before the the Cream exploit occurred. Um, and the way that the bank or pool tokens have been designed is that that, um, that particular um, exploit vector is completely uh, blunted. Uh, it's actually impossible for a user to, um, to affect the, the price of a, a BNT pool token by um, sending funds into the, to the bank or vault. Um, the only way that the, uh, the pool tokens um, appreciate in value is through a, a separate uh, a separate ledger that we call the staking ledger, um, which is uh, also used to to monitor um, things like impermanent loss and um, the the protocol's obligation to users when they withdraw. So it's a, a very um, you know at least with regards to pool tokens more generally, uh, our system is more secure. Or you know we have taken steps to make sure that um, the composability of the pool token is attractive. Right, it's not enough that something is an ERC twenty contract. Right, it's not enough that something is fungible. Um, it has to be that the um, the system that is responsible for um, for managing the valuation of that full token has to be unmanipulable, right, and immutable. Um, so yeah, look, there are security risks, um, but you know, it, with regards to the the landscape overall. Um, you know, Bancor has an extremely good track record um, where, where we move generally relatively cautiously. Um, we don't do anything um, that we, you know, we, we never do anything if we have even the, the, the slightest doubt that it's, um, that it's safe to do so. Bancor's version three, um, you know, all of the, the pool token system, everything about it will have a, an incentivized beta version um, immediately following the, the completion of the first audit. Um, and while that beta version is running, um, we will be completing a second audit um, and also running an extremely attractive bug bounty um, alongside it um, to try and really stress the system um, before we open it up for migration. Um, and even after that, so as the, the beta version comes to um, comes to a close and the, um, the second audit is completed, um, we will be uh, committing to a third audit immediately afterwards. So in terms of our um, our security, um, I would say that we are already um, among the, um, you know, the, the market leaders with regards to security consciousness. Um, one of the best um, Ethereum uh, security contract auditors in the world is, is now our CTO. So, you know, it's a, um, it, it is a security conscious project. Um, and, you know, we, we take that very seriously. Um, and especially with regards to the, the the use case that we are suggesting for our single-sided pool tokens, 
uh, we will continue to take it seriously. Um, so yeah, the, the, the new bug bounty system, um, the, the audit cycle that we're committing to, and the, um, you know, the, the, I would say the, the openness and transparency in which we, we do things um, should bring you, you know, at least some peace of mind. Um, but don't let that make you complacent either, right? It's, it's, it's a big consideration. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's well justified um, to, to uh, be cautious about it. Um, but that doesn't mean that you have to sort of, you know, be, be fearful or critical behind closed doors or something. Um, the bank or developer channel on, on Telegram is always open. Um, I have community calls like, like this one, but also on, on Twitter spaces um, and via our own Telegram channel. Um, and uh, in our Discord occasionally. Um, and if, if you have any of these concerns, if, the, if you are a, an experienced developer and you want to challenge us on, on some decisions, or if you've discovered um, something that you consider to be um, you know, a, a, an exposed security problem, uh, you can always bring that to attention and um, we would be happy to work with you to resolve it. So for these reasons, you know, I, I don't think that, I, I wouldn't say that Bancor is a, um, you know, a, a risky choice, um, but we can't ignore that there are risks with with smart contracts, and um, it's it's you know I, I don't you, I don't want anyone to think that I don't take it seriously. Mark, awesome first answer here in, in L one thousand. Great question to kick us off. Um, you know, really really good insight there. We'll circle back around to you, L. Let, let's uh, let's let Peso ask his question. How's it going, Mark? Thank you very much for coming. Love the profile pic. I want <laughs> I want to start with a fun question, you know? Um, okay. Show me some of your bags, you know? Besides BNT, what excites you in DeFi? You know, I'm actually very curious about that. Um, and then also you mentioned, I have like three questions, um, sort of short form answers maybe. Um, and then, mm -hmm. At the beginning of the call, you're like, I was thinking of a lot of different ways KeeperDAO can collab with us. But you can't just say that and then not say the ways we can collab. You know, that's like teasing <laughs> us. You know, you have to be putting out. Um, yep. And then I was listening to your community call about Bancor V3 a while back, two hours long, quality stuff though. And you mentioned the idea of sort of providing flash loans to people um, using Bancor's uh -huh. liquidity pools, I think. What do we have yeah. to do to be sort of whitelisted at a lower rate or maybe free flash loans? What do we have to put out for you to you for you oh, to give us that? Um, so that's my three questions for you. Feel free to answer them in whatever way you want. Yeah, let's let's answer them in order. Um, so yeah, my back. So my um, my um, my Ethereum wallet is is doxed. Um, so you, if anyone wants to to check this, they they can. You know, my I, I, my ENS domain is uh, is Bancor Alchemist. Um, so I I maintain something like a, a ninety nine point nine percent exposure to BNT. Um, uh, I have some Ethereum, you know, for uh, for paying for gas and things. Um, some USD, like some USDC. Generally, it's um, you know one of the things that I use to to move between. Um, my uh you know my, my payment accounts uh but you know I, i'm almost unbanked now um so i i have a you know for example a crypto.com uh visa card that i use for for paying my rent and my uh, electricity bills my internet bills for food and all of that kind of stuff but yeah no my um i used to be uh, a little bit more spread out so i had you know um the kyber network crystal back in the day <laughs> Um, and I was, you know, staking that on on their platform for for ETH rewards and things like that. But um, yeah, since since becoming involved with the um, the Bancor community to the level that I have, and um, you know, with all of the work that I do behind the scenes, I'm I, it's the 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 one crypto that I'm the most bullish on. And I maintain, you know, I put my money where my mouth is. Uh, I'm not diversified even a little bit. Um, the, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority, almost all of my personal wealth is in BNT. Um, the second question was about, um, what was it? That, yeah. What's up? Ways that uh, KeeperDAO and Bank yeah. are you envisioned of, of us collaborating. Yeah, absolutely. Ways we can collaborate. So the, uh, the 
Bankless version three has uh, a bunch of um, a bunch of jobs associated with it that is uh, extremely well suited to something like a keeper network. Um, so there's, for example, the um, we're starting to tie the bank or vortex to a couple of different tasks. Um, the rewards program on on bank or three is auto compounding. Um, so if you're a, you know, if you are a token staker. Um, and your team is offering uh, liquidity incentives on your token. All you need to do is hold that token. You know, all, all you need to do is hold that um, that full token in your wallet, and the uh, rewards accrue to it automatically without you having to do any token, like without you having to claim rewards or anything like that. Um, this is advantageous for for a slew of reasons. One is obviously the gas savings, uh, where you don't have to um, constantly part with your precious Ethereum in order to collect them. Um, but it also helps to alleviate tax drag in a lot of jurisdictions because the act of claiming rewards is usually considered income tax, uh, whereas the appreciation on a pool token is generally considered capital gains. So, you know, it means that you can stay long on your position for longer. You don't have to, you know, sell off some of your portfolio or something um, during tax season. Um, and the, you know, these types of jobs um, have to be performed by someone. Though, right, the, there's no such thing as an automatic smart contract. Uh, there is someone that has to to probe it for things, um, and so the the incentives mechanism that we use for that has to do with the fee confiscation mechanism that, that is um, uh, provided by the Bank of Vortex, um, and because of the for a number of reasons, um, but most especially including the uh, the huge gas savings um, associated with the the Bank of Three contracts. We're able to sort of piggyback a, a bunch more of these um, odd jobs, if you like, um, off of the back of the Vortex um, incentives mechanism. So the Vortex will no longer just be used to power itself, um, but we can also use it to power things like um, like rewards and other features that we haven't yet um, described publicly, but uh, will require that that sort of level of um, of automation. So you know, I, I'm always looking out for um, for, for new ways to to make this more resilient, um, one of the um, one of the collaborations that we have moving into the Bank of Three launch is with the Chainlink Keeper network, um, and this is kind of you know a uh, a, a network of, of last resort for that thing. Um, and we are you know the, the reason we're integrating with them is uh, partly because of the the the, uh, the, the huge uh, Overlap, I would say, between the BNT and Chainlink communities, um, and they love to see that you know we're working together on things, and it's kind of a um, a, a peaceful reminder that Chainlink and Bancor are, are still talking to each other regularly, and we've got lots of plans for things to do together. But there's absolutely no reason why um, the the Chainlink Keeper network should should consider itself exclusive for this kind of thing. Um, I would imagine that the uh, Keep It Down network, with, with which we already have, you know, a working product, would be um, equally, uh, you know, equally competent in in carrying out these tasks. And in general, you know, I I think that with Keep It Networks overall, it's a good idea to integrate with all of them um, because you know the the frequency and reliability of any one network um, can sort of be unpredictable. Um, and so, yeah, getting our uh, getting our contracts um, implemented and integrated in such a way that the Keep It Down network is is um, able to use it in the the most productive way possible is is absolutely something I'm I'm interested in pursuing. Um, and then I think the third question was I can't even remember I've been talking for so long now I've forgotten the third one. No worries. The third one was talking about oh my goodness Peso come back up here and ask your third question I I blanked as well. <laughs> Hey, so come on back up. You're good. Um, oh, it was about it was about flash loans, right? You guys were flash planning loans. to provide flash yeah, loans. Yeah. Our LP yeah. is basically just flash loans for our keepers. So if right. there's sort of a way we could find a, a mutually beneficial way to sort of give us sort of reduced fees, flash loans, or like like yeah, free really flash loans. Yeah. So what sort of conditions do we have to provide to you guys to make that equally beneficial? Thanks, yeah, Pat. super interesting, uh, super interesting idea. So I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, um, but obviously this would need to um, 
this would need to be something that is uh, positive, like you said, for, for, for both parties, right? It, we we, we want to provide the service and um, the Bangkok community needs to be um, needs to be assured that if we're offering something like a, a discount to the flash loan system, which by the way will be um, released with the the beta, right? It's going to be ready um, from day one. Um, that it, if we are offering that 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 service, that um, that that they are uh, involved in the the finances of that somehow. Um, I think one of the ways that we could potentially work together on something like that. Um, would be to create a something like a um, a, a series of flash loan contracts um, that are used for a specific purpose, right? And this could be something that's automated by um, by something like by KeepItDAO. Um, one of our community members um, has, for example, wondered if it would be possible to create a generic contract for providing just-in-time liquidity on Uniswap v3. Um, and you know, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that. Because I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to be the protocol that is deliberately exploiting, um, you know, other dexes or something like that. I see that as being sort of in bad taste. Um, so maybe not just in time liquidity attacks, but something of that nature, you know, something where, um, you know, there are these low hanging fruits in the ecosystem that um, can be, you know, um, that can be harvested through you know through through flash loans and if that was something that was important to um to sustaining bankos health right or if it was something that um you know served the the interests of the protocol then absolutely I, I think that um offering that that flash loan at a reduced rate um would make financial sense but i think that you know we would have to brainstorm for for a little while to figure that out um but yeah super interesting suggestion and I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring that idea further awesome hey thanks peso for those questions l we're, we're gonna have you get on and then i got dm'd a few questions after l 1000's question so l why don't you unmute and, and ask your next one yeah i would quickly like to go back to uh the original or the first discussion about um uh, making sure that we don't fragment liquidity uh, and create the snx problem um right. The, the way I see it, right, is like there's four options right now. Um, I mean, maybe there's more and, and you can tell me if, if there are. But the, the way I see it right now is currently we have those options. We either stake natively and force the user to decide. Either they provide liquidity um, and help facilitate on-chain um, liquidity or park it in a native contract, right, where it doesn't really do anything. And uh, it's, it's, it's very one-dimensionally productive there. It just earns the, uh, the coordination game uh, rewards. Um, the second option is stake natively and then set up a staking derivative pool for XRook um, right, on bank, uh, for Bancor. So basically start the entire process again, uh, that instead of Rook, we have an XRook pool. Right. And we, we do the whitelisting process again, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to me, that sounds a little redundant because that's basically right. stake Rook, get X Rook, stake X Rook, receive BNT Rook, because you guys have another um, token that's assigned to the user when they stake, right? So this seems a little redundant there. And then exactly. third option, yeah. stake Yeah, you want to keep board. these. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry, too much. Oh, yeah, yeah, the, so yeah, the third is stake into Bancor and then direct rewards into the pool, but that might have too much uh, concentration and uh, probably has the highest, I guess, uh, security risk involved or at least uh, uh -huh. security concerns from the uh, community. And then the fourth one is stake into Bancor um, and then have the nating, native staking contract uh, from the keeper DAO side, support staking the Bancor LP token instead of Rook, and then generate the rewards that way. <clears throat> and right. then I guess the the fifth option really is we support some sort of a hybrid system where the user can either stake natively into the contract, um, or there's an option to stake directly into the Bancor pool, and then um, part of those rewards yeah. are going to be directed there. So I guess like the, the question there would be, which one of those options would you see is the most feasible and that doesn't lead down the path of uh, fragmenting liquidity and creating like recreating this initial issue that we really had in the beginning of 2021 
which was there wasn't sufficient on-chain liquidity and right. we're basically going to be um, exposed too much to the uh, to the what we call the FTX cronies, right? And and be at the right. mercy of, <laughs> of, of their trading friends. Yeah, so, well said. Yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah. That's okay. Good. So yeah, I, and you're right. I know. So I think that the the broad categories that you've identified are well informed. Um, but I would say that there's kind of there's a spectrum, right? There's like an infinite number of ways that that something like this could could be deployed. Um, so I think that in general, you know, Occam's razor sort of can serve uh, utility here, um, in the sense that the, the closer you can get to the bare metal, right? The the less derivatives you have doing stuff. Um, the the better, and that's kind of the the design principle that I've taken to the bank or three contracts is that um, this should be the only liquidity, um, you know, the only liquidity derivative that is required, um, and this is you know so you know B N B N T kind of becomes its own X rook right sorry or B N B N rook becomes its own X rook. Um, the the reason for this is that you know the the, the whole market is obsessed with things like capital efficiency. Um, I, you know, even though I'm not convinced that many of the influencers know what that means, um, but I haven't heard much talk about even things like just developer efficiency, right, or systems efficiency, which is usually a, a much more important bottleneck. So, for example, let's imagine that you know we go ahead with this, um, you know, with this. Uh, let, let's say the, the the simplest version of it. Which is that you can stake Rook for for these rewards, or you can stake BN Rook for these rewards, and the the contract doesn't necessarily care which one you have. Bancor provides visibility on what the the pool tokens are worth, with you know denominated in Rook tokens, and so it's fairly easy to to distribute rewards pro rata. Um, what would be you know let's think about what might be saved in that instance. Well, you now don't need to build, audit, and maintain an X Rook contract, right? Because the um, the, the Bancor protocol is already providing that utility for you in a generic way. Um, but let's go a little bit further, right? Let's say, okay, if the Bancor protocol is already providing the x utility, what other kind of utility is it providing? Well, obviously, you know, there's the DEX utility, but let's leave that to the side for a minute. What about the rewards utility, right? How, how are rewards being distributed on the staking contract? So if you are providing BN Rook into a staking contract that the Rook developers um, have had to build, why not use the generic staking contracts that Bancor is releasing, right? So for example, um, let's imagine that the, the rewards are paid in Rook and this could be by a, you know, a token buyback system similar to Farm or something like that. Um, and that would take place you know, in an auto compounding way um, you know, that would make, that would alleviate a huge amount of tax drag and things for, for rook stakers and, and everything else. But okay, we also know that the, the reward system isn't necessarily rook denominated, right? You stake rook, but you also get ETH. Um, so can Bancor service that need? Well, actually we can, right? The, there are two generic um, rewards contracts that are being released with, with version three that any team can um, can easily um, make use of in order to service the needs of their community. So there's the same token um, rewards, which is Rook on Rook, if you like. But then we also have what we call standard rewards, which is you know what token X on Rook. Um, and so the you know we call them um, you know colloquially liquidity mining contracts, but there's no reason it has to be liquidity mining, right? You can treat them as uh, rewards distribution mechanisms. Um, and what this would potentially save you, uh, you know, the let's say the, the Rook project, the development team, um, is a huge amount of development overhead. And I think that this is one of the things that uh, communities generally, when they're demanding these kinds of products, uh, might not have a full appreciation for. That, you know, if you're creating a, a new staking contract, probably should still be audited right like if you are um you know you, you could easily fork something like the the snx contracts but there's usually going to be something some little tweaks something else that, that you want to um that you want to adjust um and so you know there's a there's an auditing overhead and then you know most communities would rather not use the contracts as they are but they want to interact with it through a front end and so now the developers need to set up a front end for for the community members to use that um, whereas what we're trying to achieve with Bancor is like, fine, if you want all of these things, right? When you look around and we see everyone doing the same thing, like 
there's so much repeated effort um, accomplishing exactly the same tasks. If you have a look around, you'll see that there's thousands of copies, maybe tens of thousands of copies of pretty much the same staking contract um, and pretty much the same front end for interacting with it. Why isn't there just like a, a general generic front end and staking contract that's good enough and secure enough um, that everyone can just use that? And I think that that's, that's kind of the vision that I have for, um, for how these liquidity mining contracts should be used at Bancor. Um, so the, you know, we get basically the, the X token, right? The X rook type functionality through the, the, um, the single sided pool token, which simultaneously creates liquidity and then um, can be received with very little, right? With almost no developer overhead um, into a staking contract in order to distribute rewards or revenue using Bancor's front end, right? It, it's meant to be a completely out of the box solution um, so that um, developers can spend their time doing, you know, things that are uh, much more central to the the protocol's purpose. So yeah, I, you know, with regards to you know the the four categories that you have um, listed there, um, the, I would say that the the one that I've spent the most time discussing right now is the the one that I was um, imagining right when I was designing Bancor Bancor three. But um, there are other options, right? It could be that um, because we have infinity pools now, um, the, the, the rook that's staked inside Bancor, uh, we can cre easily create a, um, a, a system where rook holders or, um, or even BNT community members can vote on how that rook is used. Um, and so the, the excess that is, um, that is committed to Bancor can easily be committed to something like the revenue sharing process, and we can figure out a way to, um, to translate that yield back to Rook providers. Um, I don't think that that would be too difficult. Um, but yeah, it, it, essentially what, I, what I'm trying to communicate is that the, the whole gamut of all of these different mechanisms that um, we've seen develop in, in DeFi and you know, not even DeFi, right? Some like NFT projects and things have the, this kind of utility. Um, that if we're going to be, you know, if if Bancor is hoping to call itself the uh, the the one-stop liquidity solution for all projects, which is what we aspire to be, then we need to make sure that all of these um, all of these demands and all of this utility um, is is serviced by the the product that we're offering without the need for any additional effort by the by the token team itself. So yeah, I, I do see it as as being um, well suited to your needs. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's still going to be up to the, the Rook community to decide, um, whether or not you want to use it. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. And L and Pesa, we'll get to your next one. I just, I just want to hit some of these DM'd questions that I got. Um, first, so, so th these have been really awesome kind of big picture, you know, future looking questions. Um, something that, that's been asked to us and, and got asked to me via DM to ask you, was looking at at gas efficiency of staking, where their concern was that you know if I only have you know a, a couple hundred or a thousand dollars worth of a token, you know previously it could cost somewhere between you know two to four hundred dollars to stake on yeah. on Bancor. Tell me about how that changes with Bancor three. Yeah, so yeah, Bank Bancor version two point one has prohibitively high gas. There's just you know. I, I'm not going to apologize for it. It's, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to excuse it. Uh, and I do apologize for it. Um, it was the, the, the reason why um, the, the gas is so high is, is for a couple of important reasons. One is that um, it, it's a, an artifact of the non-composability of our system. So I, I'm not sure what, um, you know, I, I mean, we're, it's the Rookkeeper DAO community call. So I'm going to assume that everyone has a, uh, you know, a, a, a above average understanding of, of Ethereum contracts. Um, but, you know, for, for those who, you know, uh, who aren't familiar, in general, the, um, the highest gas uh, costs come from writing data to and reading data from the blockchain. So whenever you have to change a state of something, that's kind of when the, the gas costs are, are really high. Um, and for staking and unstaking from Bancor, there is a huge amount of, of data that needs to be written. Um, when, you, when you provide a stake, 
Um, and the, the Banco protocol provides BNT alongside you um, to create a, a double-sided pool token. We then have to stake that pool token inside an insurance contract and record a whole bunch of information alongside it. And it's actually the, the value of the two-sided pool token that we are using to monitor and permanent loss. And so when you go to unstake, um, there's, um, we need to compare uh, two values from, from two different points in time. Um, and this is all user specific, right? It's not the case that there is a, um, a single protocol wide IL value, right? Or even a single pool wide IL value, um, or even by the way, a single user IL value. Every single moment in time that a user chooses to, to create a stake or unstake something creates its own IL profile. Um, and, you know, we've got thousands of, of users and you know every single one of them uh, may have interacted with the you know provided a, a stake in more than one token or with the same token at two different times um and so each one of those contract interactions is a unique event um and so yeah it, it's essentially it was just a um you know at, at the time that we deployed banco version 2.1 it was the absolute best um you know it was the state of state of the art no one had ever really um a, conceived of a, a dex that even would want to have this utility um so there was nothing really to to draw from um it was convincing at the time that this um that this would be um you know a good market a good market fit and certainly users love the product um but it's just an, it's just an inefficient way of achieving it so with bankor version 3 i've completely overhauled um how that is performed um, and this is largely uh, due to um, the, I mean, th there's, a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that went into it, but essentially the fungibility and composability of the pool token system um, massively reduces the, the gas costs because all pool, to all pool tokens are treated the same way. Um, there is no longer any need to record user data to the, to the blockchain, um, and that massively, massively simplifies the... Um, you know, the the process and, and alleviates a huge amount of the gas cost. The so Bancor version three will have dramatic gas savings. Even the uh, the migration from version 2.1 to version three. Um, I've had a lot of users ask me like, will that migration require them to unstake from version 2.1 and then restake in version three? The answer is no. There will be a, um, a migrate button on our front end that will allow you to do that. And the act of migrating will be more gas efficient, right? Will cost less than um, either unstaking or restaking does today. So the the, the gas optimizations in version three are, are quite profound. Um, not just for stake, not just for liquidity providers, by the way, but also for for traders. Um, so yeah, look, the it, it's a uh, it's well known that that Bancor is a, a gas heavy, um, a resource heavy deployment, um, and you know we're not proud of it. Um, and that is why it was such a high priority for us to optimize that on version three. Awesome. Great answer. Thank you. Um, and then the other DM question I got was around routing, where it looks like there's really fantastic liquidity in terms of, uh, of depth um, on, on uh -huh. for, for the Rook token. But for some reason, um, the volume doesn't seem to align with that. And, and maybe, you know, if, that, if that's got to do with, with how orders are, are routed through Bancor, maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a couple of reasons for this. One is it's always going to depend on the pair. So I'd say a lot of trade routes are generally from ETH. And because that um, involves two hops in Bancor version 2, um, then you end up paying the slippage twice and the gas twice. Um, and it's, usually, it's actually the gas cost that is the, the most significant um, component of that. Um, if, if all, in, in general, when gas prices come down um, is when Bankless volume um, starts to come up a little bit or at least become more competitive for those trade routes. Um, but having said, yeah, having said all of that, um, it's, it's really that uh, in general, people are not trading against BNT, but against something else like USDC. Or, or ETH, um, mm -hmm. that, 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 that is kind of hurting, um, hurting trades a little bit. Um, so in version three, um, we've tried, we, we've done our best to optimize that, um, that gas cost as well. And so um, one of the, you know, one of the more gas um, intensive processes there is that you actually have to send tokens between pools. So in version 2.1, 
the um, the liquidity pool contains its liquidity, right? That's the actual destination of the tokens um, when you deposit, right? That's that's where they go. And every time a trader uh, executes a trade, um, they're going to be sending tokens into the pool and out of the pool. And so if you are um, executing a trade between ETH and Rook, you first need to, for example, let's say you're buying Rook, um, your ETH will be transferred into the ETH pool. The BNT will be transferred out of that pool and then into the rook pool before the rook can get transferred out of it so there's you know there's a redundant token transfer in the background there um well not, not redundant it's an important component of the um of the you know, the numerator property for, for bnt it's how we the price of things so it's not redundant um but it can be handled more efficiently and so in version three we're adopting a vault system very similar to balance of version two and so from the traders perspective there is no second hop, right? It will just be uh, ETH in, Rook out. And the, the BNT token transfer is completely virtualized, which has significant gas savings. And so this is, a, uh, a, this is a, a, I think, a, a huge, of huge importance um, for us capturing more of, that, um, more of that trade routing, but also probably more organic trading as well. Uh, in general, Bancor has, um, you know, it usually attracts the the big trades, right? We we have the, um, you know, it's kind of a whale dex at the moment. Um, so, you know, it, it, even though the, the volume can be infrequent, um, because we do capture some of those bigger trades, um, it, it still does relatively well. Um, but look, it, it can be improved. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to, um, again, I, I'm not going to excuse that. Um, but I, I do see that you know the, the gas cost of interacting with the Bancor system is probably the number one thing holding it back. That's the the real bottleneck, I think, to all of these KPIs that we're that we're looking for. Um, and so that's that's why you know gas efficiency gas efficiency was uh, such a priority for us with with version three. And I expect that um, you know that this will help TVL because it means that you know liquidity providers can interact with us more cost efficiently. Um, but it will also um, it will also help traders interact with our contracts, um, and I think that those two things should um, should interact synergistically. So as as TVL goes up, it also means that um, trade volume will go up, and and these things can feed off each other. So yeah, I I, I put it down to gas efficiency, but we'll we'll find out. Um, I've just recently hired a uh, machine learning specialist to um, to work with me on developing something like a gauntlet system for Bancor. Um, and this is going to um, be used to, to optimize, um, you know, to, to optimize the pools to uh, generate the, the best possible profits for our liquidity providers. Um, and if that means attracting more trades and more trade routing, then we will be in an, a uniquely good position to um, to address specifically that shortcoming. So yeah, it, I think it's a, a temporary issue. Awesome. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the answer. L, why don't you go on ahead? Yeah, so the Eli 5 for us normies would be uh, Bancor competed with uh, Uniswap when they did one hop and Bancor had to do two hops because the central asset there is Bancor or the routing asset, not Ethereum. Yeah. And that's going to be fixed. Okay, so uh, anyways, um, there's a, a bigger plan that I've been working on for a while now, for two weeks, and I've been coordinating with um, both communities as well as brought Bancor team into the fold now recently, um, which is basically, you know, um, utilizing Bancor pools as part of the native staking options, as we discussed already, then also getting maybe potentially a larger sum of the buybacks directed through Bancor to get LM rewards, um, you know, migrating all LP to Bancor 3 once that drops, um, then further improvements to limit orders with KeeperDAO, um, the, the new KeeperDAO uh, offering, and then potential cashback programs and stuff like that, that we can work into that in the future as well. And also, you know, flash loans, if, if that's if, if that's the case. Uh, but a another factor of that sort of higher level proposal that I'm trying to put together right now is um, acquiring BNT as a potential um, treasury asset for us. Um, both because, you know, if, if we have this um, future sort of goal of, of growing alongside Bancor and making the, the communities more intimate between each other, uh, sort of similar how you've uh, approach the chain link community and stuff like that as well, where the the communities are very interconnected and excited about both both projects and both paths. 
then I would like us to be more aligned with Bancor also um, through our treasury, right? So I, I would right. like right. you to speak a little to uh, BNT as a treasury asset um, and how sure. it might have more flexibility than something like, for instance, DVX, which I know our community is, is full <laughs> of DVX deals. So um, okay, maybe sure. you can help me, help me build a case a little bit for, for BNT there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say anything bad uh, about, um, you know, a, a rival token, um, but I do see um, some of these, you know, the models that um, have inspired things like, like CVX. Um, I don't think that there's a huge amount of support beneath them, right? Like, the it, it's, it's mostly bolstered by, um, you know, the, that, crave of um inflationary rewards um and then trying to offset the potential price impact of that by um passing the buck by um by locking everything up um and i would say that you know we've had a, a bunch of smaller experiments already in DeFi that have proven that these lockup systems are you know you can't really bank on them um so for example um adamant finance on a I think that was Arbitrum, or I can't remember. Maybe it was Polygon, uh, but they had a, a you know a, a huge lockup system and you know, these kinds of uh, inflationary rewards, similar APYs to um, to something like CVX and what Curve is doing with its bribing and and everything else. Um, and you know when those lockups uh, came to an end, the the price almost went to zero. Um, and you know I, I expect that with the you know it's almost like everyone is having such a good time. Um, looking at you know number go up and um, seeing how many tokens that they've got that they haven't really stopped to wonder oh you know actually these assets are extremely illiquid you know with with SNX we we just spoke about the fact that you know and they weren't even you know they had some of this inflationary stuff but nothing of the the scale that that Convex is going through or that Butterfly is going through um, and you know even even with an extremely um, robust um, you know, financial model backing it, that poor liquidity problem um, was sufficient to, to essentially tank the token. Uh, well, not tank it, but, you know, to, to force it to want to perform. Um, and with something like CVX, we're looking at, you know, uh, the overwhelming majority of it is, is illiquid. Um, I'm not sure what, what people think they're going to do when they finally unlock these things. Um, there's just no, nowhere to, to realize its value in any productive sense, right, or in any real sense. Um, so I see it as being, um, you know, it's an issue that maybe they'll figure out. Um, but I, I, I have seen anyone uh, really present um, a, a case for, for how those problems are, are going to um, are going to be addressed. In fact, I haven't even seen many people from from that side of the aisle even uh, recognize that that these problems are present. It's as if the disinflationary mechanism and lockup. Um, can just continue forever and assume that no one ever needs to get out of that position or, or realize value from it. So I, th I think it's a big problem. Uh, I also think that with Butterfly, um, or Redacted Cartel, sorry, um, that it has demonstrated that there is sort of a redundancy to it. Um, there's also things like, you know, Tokamak and Vodamac, um, where we're realizing now that there's no limit to how many um, protocols you can build on top of protocols uh, that don't do anything else except inflate the supply of the token that they are seeking to perform a 51% attack on. So, you know, it's, I see it as being um, an unsustainable model already. Um, and it seems that uh, people are building uh, more and more infrastructure on top of what is already a shaky foundation. So I would just, you know, uh, if we, we have a lot of CVX whales in, in the audience, I don't want you to think that I'm, um, you know that I'm speaking illy of of a compete of a competing product for no reason. Um, in fact, you know the the foundation underneath a lot of those um, uh, under those projects is Curve, and Curve is obviously one of the um, one of the most exciting, one of the best um, DeFi products that that's been developed in you know since since 2020. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that project, just not a huge fan of its um, inflationary uh, rewards mechanisms. So BNT is is quite unique um, because one it's it's not a governance token. Um, it's uh, L has actually previously um, referred to it as a balance sheet token, and I agree with that. Um, it's more like an index 
So as because BNT is 50% of the protocol at all times, um, the um, the natural uh, price fluctuations within its liquidity pools um, one cause BNT to be absorbed from secondary markets, so it so sort of slowly gets sucked into the um, sucked into the protocol through trading, and it kind of gets stuck there through um, through trading fees. But then it's also got you know there's another equilibrium position where it's slowly leaking out through um, through price appreciation. So when um, when the BNT price is going up, obviously that means that the secondary supply is increasing, um, and then also through um, you know insurance payouts. But then we also have something like, you know, the bank or vortex, which is helping to offset those things. So there's a, a complex uh, equilibrium system happening in the background that is, um, you know, that is really, really unique and uh, to, to BNT. And um, it's extremely robust, partially because of the size of BNT's liquidity, right? I think it, I, I haven't looked recently, but I think that it is the, the most liquid, um, uh, the, the most liquid DeFi asset in existence. And I, I think that it will always be that. Um, so yeah, the combined so its liquidity combined with its index properties make it extremely attractive. I think from a um, from a treasury perspective, because it kind of has this natural um, you know th this natural magnetism to the um, the the index of the cryptocurrency markets in general. So you know there it has proven right that it can outperform uh, the rest of the market at times. Um, I think actually BNT. Uh, is the uh, the second best performing DeFi asset after YFI in terms of price appreciation the cycle. So you know it's it's not a perfect index. It, it can outperform it, um, and it's actually partially because um, as speculation on on the asset is increasing, that um, that as long as a non-zero uh, proportion of of the people that that purchased it decide to stake it, then it's actually kind of it kind of ratchets up. Um, the index a little bit. Um, so, I, you know, I don't want to speak too much about these things. I, I generally don't like talking about price stuff. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, give as good an answer as I can because we are talking about treasury management. But yeah, it's, a lot of people see it as kind of their, the risk off component of their portfolio. Um, they see it as something that is, you know, kind of moves naturally with, with ETH and, and Bitcoin and, um, and Chainlink because these are the three deepest pools on our, on our system. Um, and it does, right? It's got a pretty high row factor um, for the for the deepest pools. Um, and you know, if you are if you are holding BNT, right, and it is um, you know, and you're staking it for um, for the the BNT trade revenue that it generates, and also the you know, we have we do have our own inflation. It's just a lot more conservative than um, than elsewhere in the system, and um, we're, we're targeting a, a zero inflation model over time. But uh, if you are taking it, then you have VBNT, and VBNT is the voting token, right? BNT is is not a governance token, but VBNT is, um, and in a way, it's kind of a proof of stake governance token, which means that the uh, the people that are voting on proposals in in Bank or DAO, um, the only way that they can do so is to have liquidity locked inside the protocol, which means that everyone that's participating has a financial interest in making sure that the protocol is run well. Which is nice because, you know, as I was saying before about things like CBX, um, it's not entirely clear what their incentives are, right? If, if people stop paying them um, in inflationary rewards, I doubt that they would, um, you know, continue to govern the system well. Um, and even now, right, it's, I think it's demonstrable that with um, even just CRV, right, even just with Curve, um, because they don't have any, um, any stake, right, They're, because they don't have any skin in the game. Um, it's very easy to uh, force them to make a bad decision, and they've, they've demonstrated this um, more than once. Um, that you know they, they don't actually care about the health of their economy, only the um, bribes that they're receiving. So Bancor is a, a much more pragmatic governance, right? It's it's much more open to um, healthy collaboration. Everyone's um, everyone's trying to achieve the same thing, right? How to how to keep markets healthy, how to protect tokens, how to protect liquidity providers. Um, and how to how to keep um, uh, how to keep traders happy, basically. So if you do have a significant, like if the treasury uh, does have a significant stake in um, in Bancor, both with BNT and with Rook, for example, one of the advantages is is that 
it gives you a, uh, a prominent voice in the way that your uh, liquidity uh, is run. So it could be that, for example, um, that you are anticipating, like maybe there's going to be an unlock or you are talking to people behind the scenes, you know, that there's a bunch of um, whales or, or something else that are looking to, to get into or get out of Rook. Um, and you need the, you know, you need the liquidity to support those demands. Um, the Bancor community is, is extremely uh, receptive to these ideas, right? When you need liquidity, you need liquidity. And so if you want the pool to be deeper, just ask, right? And sometimes the best way to ask or the best way to participate in those um, discussions is to actually be an active participant in them. Um, and so, yeah, if, if it's important that, um, that Rook's liquidity be maintained, right? And if it's important that the pool be healthy, then having BNT, which is earning rewards, right? And earning uh, revenue um, on your balance sheet and serving as an, as an index, right? It could actually be an anchor through which the, the rest of the treasury um, sort of uh, moves relative to. It's, it's, I, I mean, personally, I don't think it's a bad deal. Um, but, you know, of course, you should realize that I'm extremely biased. Like I said at the beginning of this call, 99.9% .9 of my personal wealth is in BNT. Um, so obviously, I'm convinced that it's a, um, a good thing to, to have. Um, and you should, therefore, uh, treat everything that I've said, um, you know, with a grain of salt. You should, as with anyone talking about cryptocurrency, and especially when it comes to, to price and investment stuff, that, um, you know, you, that you um, view everything that I've said with a, a, hel a healthy dose of skepticism. Um, but if any of these uh, any of these concepts are interesting, um, I'm more than happy to pursue these conversations in a maybe one on one sort of uh, context. Um, you know, it, I, I'm happy to to discuss quite in, in frank terms what what BNT's properties are and things like that. I don't want anyone to think that anything that I've said is you know um, suggesting necessarily that um, that I am encouraging the the Rook community to buy BNT. I can't do that. I'm extremely regulatory exposed. I'm you know the Bancor um, the Bancor Foundation myself. You know, ad, as an employee of the Bancor Foundation, I'm regulated under uh, Finma laws, and so I I you know I cannot recommend that anyone uh, buy BNT or anything like that. But I can answer questions about its you know, price history, about its its financial properties and things like that. So I just want to be clear that I am not stating that the uh, that Rook should buy BNT. But if you are interested in buying BNT, I can talk about um, about some of the the properties that it has. Mark, you you, you put a big old smile on my face, and and thanks for for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. Uh, Peso, yeah, my pleasure. You got another question. Yes, sir. One more question. Um, all right. So you guys are sort of routing um, or you guys have our limit order feature enabled on Bancor, right? And that's very nice. Appreciate it very much. Um, what is going to happen to that limit order feature once we start upgrading it? Will you guys be following through on sort of every patch that we have, or will you guys sort of keep it as is? Because we're up, we're coming out with sort of an Insta fill feature, or or maybe it's going to oh, be really? called Insta swap or whatever. Will you guys be sort of including that onto your your platform, or will you guys opt out because you guys are basically already providing sort of an Insta swap feature with with Bancor's sort of existing decks? No, 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 absolutely not. No, I, I, I'm very interested in, um, in, in maintaining these features. And, you know, just because we've got the, the InstaSwap function doesn't mean that the, um, the, the limit order function that, that Rook provides is made redundant. Um, you know, I don't even see these as necessarily being competitors. Um, the InstaSwap, you know, the InstaSwap function that we, that we have, um, you know, it, it still uses exclusively Bancor's liquidity, right? We can't, uh, we, we, we currently don't route trades um, anywhere except within our own pools. If someone's using one inch or something like that, then it's um, often ca the case that um, Bancor can be, you know, a component in that trade route. Um, but we don't, you know, our contracts don't have visibility on, on Uniswap or Kyber or anyone else. Um, 
whereas the the, the rook functionality uh, means that the the traders that arrive on our site um, actually do have access to it, right? So they can they're presented with with Bancor's offering, um, but if they can get a, a better price by um, by cooperating with the with that rook function, then absolutely I want them to have it. I see it as being additive, not competitive. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's really cool. And, and I think that's a conversation we can continue to explore as well. Um, I did get one more question DM'd to me about staking rewards. So currently in, in, in I guess, uh, 2.1 for you guys, it, th what, what they're saying is that the, the lion's share of, of rewards are for people that provide BNT to that specific pool. Is that yeah. is that a structure that's going to be maintained in in V three? Yeah, in fact, we're going to lean into it even more. So I think that the lion's share is uh, is currently seventy percent. Um, with the so I've just run um, the the numbers on this to try and create a budget for liquidity mining um, over Christmas, and I think that it makes sense for us to move to something like a seventy five percent share. Um, but there's a couple of reasons why. Well, I I don't think this is going to be controversial, right? It's the, the the BNT token it should be shared predominantly with with BNT stakers. That's just how it is. Um, the reason why um, I, I would say that the the BNT community has been um, so you know I don't want to use the word generous. Let's say pragmatic, right? The reason why they've been um, you know uh, so willing to um, to share the, the the inflationary rewards with their TKM brethren. Uh, one is because they're primarily the same group, right? Uh, a lot of people that um, that stake TKN uh, actually have ended up becoming, you know, BNT sort of, I don't want to say BNT maximalist, but say BNT enthusiasts. Uh, I was expecting a huge amount more um, it, with regards to selling pressure on the BNT token as a result of our liquidity mining. And, you know, it's been um, absolutely uh, phenomenal to see that those numbers have come back way lower than my lowest expectations. Um, so, uh, you know, it's been supportive, right? We've actually managed to grow our community quite a ways. Um, but then it was also out of necessity, right? The, um, it was impossible or not impossible, but it was difficult, right? It was a, a, a technical nightmare for third party projects to offer their own liquidity mining incentives on, on version 2.1. Uh, a couple of groups did achieve it though, by the way. So the, the itchy developers. Um, the, the smart contract wizards over there figured out how to get really good visibility on users who were providing itchy liquidity. And so they created this, uh, this amazing hybrid liquidity, uh, this amazing hybrid liquidity mining system where if you provide liquidity on Bancor, you're automatically qualified for um, itchy mining rewards on, on their own um, on their own itchy farm. So it has been done, but uh, you know, unless you're as clever as they are, um, it's it's really inconvenient, so it requires you know um, a, a special kind of motivation for someone to commit that level of effort. Um, but with Bankwell three, it's it couldn't be easier, right? It, like I said you, you, earlier in the call, um, you don't need to make your own contract, you don't need to support your own front end or anything like that. Uh, Bankwell is giving token teams everything they need right out of the box to support their own liquidity mining incentives. Um, and so I think that uh, that um, that shift in you know the 70 percent going up to 75 percent one i think it's pretty minor um, i don't think that anyone's going to be particularly upset that um that it, it's shrinking down slightly on the tkn side um but two it also means that there's um more room right for for tkn um projects to provide their own liquidity mining incentives for their community um, and those liquidity mining incentives, you know, if they want it to be exclusive for, for their own community, exclusive for the, the TK inside of the pool, we're fine with that, right? It's not, it doesn't, they don't have to share it with BNT, uh, they don't have to do anything. Um, so I think that it's, you know, it, it's going to be a, a very positive change um, with regards to the, you know, the, the fact that BNT has had to shoulder so much of that burden um, over the last year already. So yeah, it's going to alleviate some of that that pressure. We can start directing more of that, that APY back to our own community, um, but then also it's going to uh, result in, in more meaningful collaborations um, between um, ourselves and other projects that are trying to incentivize their own liquidity pools. 
Got it. And she, I mean, you answered my follow up to that already about about directing, you know, uh, non BNT uh, rewards through your pool. So really, really interesting stuff. Um, I got one more question DM to me. Um, and if anyone else has a question, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of uh, start working towards kind of the, the end of the call here. But but just one that I saw was talking about L2 and, and Bancor V3. Right. Um, and, and, and how those two might fit together. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's going to be a community decision. This is something that the, um, the Bancor team is, is adamant on, that you know, we're not going to make a, an, any official recommendations. We can provide advice and, and insight maybe, um, but we really want this to be 100% a, a, a you know, untainted DAO decision. Um, with regards to you know, with regards to the the kind of insight that I've been um, providing, it's sort of okay. L, I think that when L two first arrived, um, people had it in their head that it's kind of this one, you know, this magic bullet that kind of just fixes Ethereum, and. Those early conversations kind of revealed to me that one, you know, probably a lot of community members don't at that time weren't aware that you can, you should just kind of treat layer two like a separate chain. Um, and so, you know, we've got things like Polygon, which are very easily identifiable as an Ethereum sidechain rather than you know a, a part of the Ethereum infrastructure. Um, but then things like Optimism and Arbitrum, you know, they're still you know, I still think of them as being different chains. You know, it, it's a, it, they still borrow from Ethereum's security layer, and that's terrific, right? I, I, I still think Ethereum is the most secure chain that there is. Um, and so it makes sense to, to, um, to build your chain that borrows from, um, you know, from that assurance that Ethereum already supports. But, you know, they're, they're kind of, I, I would say that they're not ready, right? It's kind of premature to get, too excited about the true L2s. Um, I think optimism is is probably the easiest to develop on. You can. Uh, it would be very very easy for us to move Bancor version three to optimism, for example, if, if we really wanted to. Um, Arbitrum is not too uh, too different. It does have some nuances that I don't think people are um, that you know are exposed to. So, for example, for a Dex. There are certain security features that we need to build in to prevent things like virtual price manipulation attacks. So if you were um, on Ethereum during DeFi summer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I remember flash loan attacks was like all the rage for like two straight weeks with all of these naive um, DEX projects forgetting, right, that if you just provide, um, you know, if you don't provide any protection against those kinds of uh, manipulations, that it's very easy to exploit um, liquidity providers and even traders, right? Front running and sandwich attacks and, and things like that. And Bancor, Bancor version 2.1 and Bancor version 3 are, um, you know, I would say we need to be especially uh, security conscious with regards to virtual price manipulations because of the effect that it has on um, things like impermanent loss protection, right? We, we can't allow people to perform uh, effective insurance fraud using our contracts. Um, and so we use things like um, a moving average. Um, we're, we're actually, we, so the, the low pass filter that we have for version 2.1 was an effective 600 second SMA. Um, and this makes it, you know, this makes it extremely robust against things like flash loan attacks. Um, we're actually updating that a little bit to be uh, more gas efficient. So on version three, we're moving to an EMA model, which isn't time dependent. Um, but we'll still have, you know, um, a, a, a block check at the front. When you do, um, w when you're present on things like Arbitrum, it's very, very easy for miners to collude to change the time element to how some of these uh, security features work. And in fact, on Arbitrum, you could even make the argument that some, like the block numbers don't mean anything. If, if the miner decides that a million years has passed, then a million years has passed. And that means that these kinds of virtual price manipulation attacks become more feasible all of a sudden. Now, there are ways around that. Uh, Arbitrum offers you its own um, sequencer, uh, which you know, is, is helpful, but I, I suspect that we would probably want to um, either, either build our own version of it or um, change the way that, that we would integrate with it. But there is some technical overhead there, right? It's, it's not a convenient place to deploy, 
when you're considering the, um, the kind of security exposure, exposure for, for a DEX. Optimism is slightly easier, um, like I said before, but it's, it's still imperfect. Um, and even things like Solana have these problems, right? The, and as we, as we just saw recently, right, the, the, um, the programming language that is used to support Solana um, allows for some more um, exotic type of, of code attacks. Um, and this is, it's actually this, um, this type of exotic attack that was used to exploit the, um, the wormhole bridge um, just um, earlier. So yeah, layer two, in my opinion, it's not ready for prime time. Um, I think that it's extremely encouraging, right? I think that the Optimism and Arbitrum teams have done uh, phenomenal work. StarkNet is just around the corner, and I think that that's also going to be super phenomenal. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how those um, ecosystems grow. But is now the right time to be on those ecosystems? I'm not convinced. Um, I would much, you know, I, I think that even though they offer, a, you know, this this massively improved scalability and this, you know, this much better transaction finality and, and everything else, you still need to be certain that there's a good reason to be there. And mostly the layer twos are, are relatively empty compared to the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and that's important because Bancor is a DEX, right? We we do want to make sure that um, when we go there, where that there's a liquidity need um, that is being serviced when we arrive. We can't just go there and kind of get our layer two badge and say, look, we defeated layer two or something. You know, it, there needs to be a good uh, financial motive to, to be there. And I think that layer two doesn't necessarily have that just yet. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't be on faster, cheaper chains. Um, I, you know, I just recently had a community call with um, with Phantom. Um, I've had a community call with um, with Avalanche. I've been invited to speak at um, at the um, Avalanche Summit in in Barcelona. Um, so you know, we are always um, you know talking to these other chains. The the Polygon team is a very close friend um, to the Bancor team, um, and I expect that um, we'll probably um, deploy there at some stage. But like I said, it's really a community decision. If I had to sort of read the lie of the land, right, from, from all of the, the Twitter communications, from the Telegram chats and everything else, I would say that probably um, it's more likely to be a first deployment on something like Avalanche, Polygon, and Phantom than um, Optimism, than Optimism or, or Arbitrum or, or StockNet at this stage. But I think that... You know, we will see the the tide turn um, pretty quickly when those layer two solutions really start to show us what they're made of. Um, I just think it's too soon. For sure. Awesome. Awesome. Really, really good stuff, Mark. Um, you know, I, I, I want to be respective of your time, too. This is, has been just a really, really insightful call. Um, so let me just I'll make a last call for, for any questions here. If anyone's got one last one. Um, if not, then then we can go on ahead and just say a, a huge thank you to you for for coming in and walking us through all, all of these different questions that our community had. Um, so does anyone yeah, got a pleasure? Of course. Yeah, and you know, if uh, if anyone is too shy, um, I know that uh, you know stage fright is a is a big deal. Um, so maybe you didn't want to be the center of attention or, or have to um, you know have your voice broadcast across the internet. I, I understand. Um, but if, if there's anything that I've spoken to or anything that I haven't spoken to that you that you wanted me to address, um, you know, feel free to DM me. Um, I'm doxed everywhere. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Telegram. Uh, I think even my email now is is relatively Googleable. Um, so, yeah, if, if there's anything that you want to talk about um, and you didn't want to for any reason bring it up on this call, uh, I just wanted to invite you to reach out to me privately and, and that I will... Um, I, I, I promise to 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 answer you. Yeah, Mark, I think they're afraid of sounding like me on these calls. <laughs> um, but hey, thank you so much for coming. I mean, this has been really, really fantastic. And, um, you know, we look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Um, and and really just a, a huge congratulations on, on what I'm already seeing Bancor V3 looking like. It, uh, I'm excited for you. Thank guys. you so much. It, it's been, yeah, honestly, this has been one of the best community calls I think I've been on you. Uh, I, the, the questions were were on point. Uh, I think that the you've got a, a good community here. You guys should be very proud. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I'm going to go on ahead and, and, and wrap this up. Just a, a few quick housekeeping items as well. Um, if you didn't see our announcement yesterday about um, us coordinating with, with Gamma Strategies, hop on in, uh, read the proposal as well. Um, it's something that we're excited about, again, as you know, we're, we're continuing to, to drive uh, integrations and, and cooperation with, with other protocols. This is another great step in that direction. So um, yeah, I would encourage you to go check that out. Um, another thing is another reminder on our jobs board, head over to keeperdow.com slash careers, check out our jobs board if you haven't done that already. And then just lastly, uh, if you haven't checked out the status hub this week, we, we updated a few things. If you just want to check in on coordination game development, uh, check out the, the status hub that's in our official links as well. But again, Mark, thank you so much for hopping on. Everybody that, that came today, thank, thanks for your questions and, and for being here and supporting. Um, this has just been another fantastic call. So, so thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody. Well, hey, thanks for joining us again. I'm, I'm What's the Deets. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking to you guys again next time. Thanks, everybody.